and welcome to this week's episode. My name is Cassidy Cash. This week we're going to be taking a look at how to make posset pie. Now I'm taking a nod from Folger Research Library this week because they celebrated Pie Day back on Thursday of this week by making a posset pie. And while posset can be made into a pie, it started out as a beverage. It's kind of like the word sauce or pesto in that it can mean a lot of different things. So this week, we're going to explore the history of posset, where it shows up in William Shakespeare's plays, and how you can make your very own posset pie at home. So this week, I've been following Folger Research on Twitter, and I'm going to link to their feed below, not because I'm affiliated with them or anything, but just because it's been great fun following along with all of the polls and questions that they're asking. They've been talking with Dr. I think her name is Marissa Nicosia. I actually don't know how to pronounce her last name, but I will link to that below as well. It's very beautifully written. I'm sure it is also beautifully pronounced. Um, and one of the perils of reading something for the first time is not necessarily having a pronunciation guide. So I'm sorry, Dr. Nicosia. You can also find her at Rare Cooking. Uh, she runs the blog called Cooking in the Archives. And she goes through a lot of old, many of them, recipes from Shakespeare's lifetime, and she practices cooking them. And I'm delighted to find her because, as you know, here on That Shakespeare Life YouTube channel, we go back and look at a lot of aspects from William Shakespeare's life, including recipes. So a lot of her stuff will probably show up here and in the future, and it's definitely what we're going to use for today's episode. With posset, it's kind of this all-purpose word. It's a general term for a milk and sugar-based custard-type thing, almost like the word gravy. You can have all different kinds, or sauces, you can have all different kinds. Well, with posset, in Shakespeare's lifetime, it was most often used as a medicinal beverage, and it was almost like an eggnog. You took a milk and sugar-based liquid and then you added alcohol and it was used for warding off a fever or it had other medicinal applications. And as Bulger Research points out, posset is really an example of how foods in Shakespeare's lifetime kind of walked across what they call a boundary between food and medicine. They kind of all flowed together for Shakespeare's lifetime, and posset is an example of that. Today we're going to be making our own version of a posset and turning it into a pie. Now, here at my house, my kids help me out with these recipes, and my son has food allergies. So we're going to be using some non-historically accurate ingredients so that the final product is something my kids can enjoy eating with us. But I am going to link you to what the most historically accurate food item would be so that if you want to get it exactly right and cook it historically accurate, accurate in a precise way, you can do that at home. The way that we're doing it is allergy friendly. The OED talks about posset and says that it is a drink made from hot milk curdled with liquor. Now that can be ale or wine or something else. Sack was really popular. There are recipes actually called sack posset. And you added sugar and herbs and spices, and you most often drank it for medicinal purposes. But there are recipes for using it in desserts and other kinds of dishes. Constance Hall actually made a recipe and used this as a dewormer. So like if you were infected with worms, you could mix posset in with a certain herbs. I think she used worm seed and some other things. And you drank it to get worms out of your body, which sounds really disgusting, but it's an example of how it was medicinal. Sarah Long used posset to make fritters, and she used it almost like a batter. She says you mix three pints of milk with a quart of ale, and you make a posset of these. And so posset could be drank by itself, but it could also be used as an ingredient or a base for other more elaborate dishes, as Sarah Long uses it to batter and fry up some apple fritters. So posset by itself, when you were drinking it as a drink, there were these unique pots called posset pots, and they were shaped kind of like a teapot, except the spout comes out of the center, and you've got these handles, and you can pour it, and that's because posset, when you made it, created a foam, and you wanted to drink the drink out from underneath the foam, and the pot lets you pour off just the liquid part that you wanted to consume, so that's there. So that's the history of posset. Here's a couple of places where it shows up in Shakespeare's plays. In Hamlet, Act 1, Scene 5, Hamlet's father's ghost says, As swift as quick silver, it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigor it doth posset and curd like eager droppings into milk. So you can see the connection there of 
for Shakespeare's audience, posset was curdled milk. And he's using that to paint that kind of picture in that play. In Macbeth, Act 2, Scene 2, Lady Macbeth says, The doors are open and the surfeited grooms do mock their charge with snores. I have drugged their possets that death and nature do contend about them whether they live or die. So posset was a popular drink. It was something that they would have drank and Lady Macbeth essentially drugged their eggnog. Then in Merry Wives of Windsor, Act 1, Scene 4, as well as in Act 5, Scene 5, there are two references to posset. The first says, go and we'll have a posset for it's soon at night in faith at the latter end of a sea coal fire. So it was part of this kind of celebratory beverage. And then the second reference is, yet be cheerful night, thou shalt eat a posset tonight at my house. And so that reference actually indicates that it was not only used as a drink during Shakespeare's lifetime, but was actually added to things like desserts, cakes, pies, like we're going to make today, that could actually be eaten as opposed to simply drank. So posset had a lot of different uses. The recipe that we're going to do today is considered um, historically based. I don't want to go so far as to call it historically accurate because there are a lot of culinary historians. My friend Brigida does a lot of work into making sure that she cooks very historically accurate Tudor recipes. So I want to be very respectful to people like her who do it tremendously accurately. So today, the recipe that I'm doing is historically based and it's representative of what would have happened in Shakespeare's lifetime. So if you're cooking this at home with your kids, like I'm cooking it with my kids, you can feel like you're cooking a Shakespearean recipe at home. Let's get started. The first thing we're gonna do is make the orange peels. Okay, hold up. You're probably thinking, I thought we were making posset and she's talking about orange peels. Well, when you're making a historical recipe and you're adapting it to be allergy friendly, it ends up being a long process. We made our own candied orange peels and our own pie crust and it ended up being so long, I had to do a video series instead of putting it all into one video. Part one is how to make posset, which is what this video will be about. Parts two and three are how to make candy candied orange peels and how to make a basic pie crust, both of which also have references in Shakespeare and a historical background that I share with you in those episodes as well. Subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss the parts two and three episodes. But for now, back to making posset. So for the apple portion or the filling portion, you could probably use applesauce. You could also use sliced apples. The recipe from the Folger Research Library says that you roast the apples and then you mash them up. To me, that sounded a lot like applesauce. So you could probably just use applesauce. I kind of wanted to make the final product look prettier than just mashed up baked applesauce, which is going to make like a custard. And so what I'm going to do is actually make the posset on its own, which is the milk, egg, sugar, and spices mixture uh, that's gonna turn into basically a custard is what you're making. And I'm gonna take the apples and slice them really thin and then pour the posset over the apples in the pan so that when it bakes up, you can see slices of apple in there and it just presentation-wise will look much prettier. At least that's the hope. So let's find out. Let's peel our apples first and then we'll make our posset. So what we're gonna do, that guy has a worm in it. Throw that away. Can you throw that away? Yeah. Okay. There we I'm also leaving the peel on because I think the red color peeking up out of the top is going to be very pretty. So I'm cutting the tops and sides off and then I'm just cutting around the core of the apple and then slicing this up into slices. Once we sliced our apples, we lined them into our pie crust. You can use a pre-made pie crust. We made our own and it is gluten, corn, dye, dairy-free, designed to be allergy-friendly pie crust. And there's a recipe for that over on the YouTube channel, so be sure to check that out. 
but whatever pie crust you use, at this point, you're gonna take your sliced apples and line the pan with them in a decorative way. We chose to do columns. You could do a spiral or any other shape that you think is pretty. Now that we've got the apples all lined out on our pie pan, we can make the posset. I'm actually going to sprinkle cinnamon and sugar over the apples first because the sugar will help break down the apples and get the flavor really in there so that when it bakes, it bakes fully through uh, without, you don't wanna end up with a custard that's baked through, but the apples are not done yet. Then you'll have a crunchy pie and that's no good. So we want the sugar to break down the apples before we pour the posset over there. So I'm gonna sprinkle the apples with sugar. you start with three eggs. I'm using the egg shells to siphon out just the yolk. You put the egg whites in another cup and save the egg yolks. I start out with three and mix that into a posset. And then I actually ended up having to make this again and adding a second round of posset to my pan because it ends up not being quite enough to fill our pie pan with just three egg yolks. When I was following the Folger Research Library on Twitter, they took a poll of how many eggs they should use because the 16th century recipe just said, add yolks. And the Twitter feed said, hey, use three. But that wasn't nearly enough for me. So here I'm mixing it up with three yolks and then I do it again later and add it to the pan. Once you've got your yolks in there, then you're gonna add a half a cup of sugar to three egg yolks. And I chose half a cup because I'd already put a half a cup over the apples and I didn't want it to be too sweet. After I put the yolks in there, I mix it in with some sugar and I add about half a cup of heavy cream. Any kind of sweet cream is what the 16th century recipe called for. I used heavy coconut cream here in our version. You could use any kind of cream that's available to you. Of course, if you own a cow and would like to milk your own cow and use fresh sweet cream, then that's the most authentic. We went with what my kids could eat for today. After we added in the sugar, we scraped out the center of a vanilla bean and added that to the mix. You could use vanilla extract or almond extract. Um, vanilla bean is probably more historically accurate simply because they probably grew herbs and plants like that in Stratford upon Avon, but adding some kind of herbs and spices is what the 16th century recipe called for. So you could use cinnamon, cloves, vanilla, almond, rose water would be very, very specific to Tudor cooking. A lot of posset recipes actually calls for rose water, so that's an herb that you could consider, but just add it in there and mix it all up. After you add in the spices that you want to choose, then you add your sack, alcohol, whiskey, or in our recipe, we're using dry sherry because that's what the Folger Research Library used in theirs. And we were kind of following along with them on Twitter because it was fun. So you mix all of that up, use a whisk, and that'll get it all nice and smooth and make it easy to pour into your pan. And once you have that all poured in there, then voila, you have posset. Now that we've made our posset, we're going to pour the Pass it over the top of the fruit, and then we're gonna cook this at 350 for about 20 to 25 minutes. So we pour this all oh. really good. Oh, doesn't it smell good? Yeah. I've heard the two. This doesn't look like enough, however. <laughs> it doesn't quite cover the whole pan. So we're gonna mix this up again in the same way, but just again, um, to cover the whole pan. There we go, and that covered the whole thing. Right before it goes in the oven, we add our candied orange peels to be decorative. You could buy these at the store, or you can check out the link below this video to find out how to make your own candied orange peels. Once it was all set, we placed it in the oven at 350 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. We ended up checking it every 10 minutes after the 20 minute mark and it took a full 40 minutes for our custard to really set up. It ended up being thicker than we expected, but once it was done, it was a beautiful pie. That's it for this week. I'm Cassidy Cash. I hope you learned something new about the Bard. If you enjoyed this episode, please check out the podcast episode with Francine Segan. You can find out more about that at CassidyCash.com slash That Shakespeare Life and search 
Francine Segan, or you can check out the show notes below this video, and I'll link you directly to the episode. But she is a food historian who wrote a cookbook specifically on recipes from Shakespeare's lifetime, and I'll link to that below this episode. Don't forget to grab your copy of the recipes down below. When you sign up to become a newsletter subscriber to That Shakespeare Life, you can get printable copies of the recipes that we went through today, and there's like three iterations. There's the version that you would do if you're not allergy-friendly. There's the version that was from the history book, and then there's my version that we did on the video today. So check that out below, sign up and download that, and I'll see you next Saturday. Thanks for being here. Bye-bye.